Well, as you can see from looking at the volunteer shirts around you in the pews today, our theme for this year's VBS was Start the Party. In fact, that's the song that the children sang in the video we watched at the beginning of service. But as I was preparing, I was the Bible Time station leader, so I went through the Bible stories with the kids, and as I was preparing these stories and reading through the material, I thought of how little we naturally think of our Christian faith as something like a party, how often it can easily seep into an observance of the rules, feeling guilty and beating ourselves up for repeatedly failing to follow the law that God lays before us. And so easily forgetting that our lives now in Jesus are done in the freedom and grace of the good news of the gospel. In other words, the party that Jesus started a long time ago that continues to this day and that will continue into eternity. So we don't often think of our Christian faith as a party, but we should. But let me ask you about this concept in another way. Do you have joy in Jesus? That's a sincere question. Do you have joy in Jesus? Does the revealed knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ bring you joy? This is going to be the focus of our meditation on God's Word today. As we recall the main elements of the themes from VBS this past week, but also the text that I put into the service today, it was our first reading from Acts chapter 2. Our memory verse for our VBS was verse 28 of Acts chapter 2, you have made known to me the paths of life, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. And that kicks off the theme and takeaway from our Vacation Bible School and our meditation this morning. Because the answer, whether right now you're feeling it or not, the answer to the question of do you have joy in Jesus is yes, I have joy in Jesus. So start the party is a joyous phrase. I had asked the kids when we were talking about the part of the story where the celebrating began, and I would ask them, when you have a party or somebody invites you to a really cool party, Is your reaction one of glum resignation? Just like, okay, I'll come. Woohoo, I'm going to a party, right? No, it's one of celebration and joy. Think of the coolest party that you've ever been invited to in your life. Maybe it was a party that you thought, how did I end up here? And nobody had to tell you to be happy, you just were. Because the food was amazing, it was, the people and the fellowship you enjoyed was wonderful, the conversations you had, and often a phrase that we describe evenings like that is we wish they would never end. Not because there's something we do grudgingly or out of some sense of duty, but because it is joyful. So as I mentioned, I'm, I did the Bible time station, or, or the stories from the Bible, And Acts chapter 2 gives a wonderful summary of all of the Bible stories' emphases this past week. Now, we did four four really main stories. A couple of them, two were direct events in Jesus' ministry, the calling of His first disciples. In this case, we focused in on the calling of Matthew. And then the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And then two of the accounts were Jesus telling a parable, Him telling a parable to teach the listeners of the parable, His disciples, the religious leaders who opposed His ministry and what He had come to do, and of course today, us, something new and exciting about the kingdom of heaven, that somewhere along the way we had forgotten the nature of God and Jesus was here to show it to us. So first, we're going to look at the two events. We're going to look at the calling of Matthew and the Samaritan woman at the well. So what is joyous for us as we read about the calling of Matthew to be a disciple? That's the question in the back of our mind as we go through each of these accounts. What is joyous about this? Well, as I shared with the children, I said when the tax collectors came around, 
What did everybody else say? They said, boo. They didn't like the tax collectors. And often the tax collectors, were told, took more than they were supposed to. But even if they didn't, they were still not well-liked because they were perceived to be helping out the enemies of God's people. They worked for the Romans, and they took money from the Jews and gave it to the Romans. So much is this animus against tax collectors that they're lumped in with the general category of sinners... And after Jesus calls Matthew to be his disciple, he gets together and has a celebration with a bunch of other tax collectors, and the religious leaders of the day come up to his disciples and say, what is he doing? Why is he eating with those people, those tax collectors and sinners? Well, the story tells us how Jesus feels about tax collectors and sinners. He doesn't say, boo, boo and he doesn't avoid them. Instead, he walks right up to Matthew and says, follow me. Become my disciple. Not only does that demonstrate his love for Matthew, but also that he wants to spend even more time with this guy that everybody else doesn't even want to come close to. Matthew, in other words, is not worthy of such love. Because it's not that the world is wrong about the unworthy. It's not that they were wrong that some of the tax collectors stole from people. We know that from the account about Zacchaeus. And the the text doesn't tell us whether Matthew did that or not. He may very well have. So it's not that the world is wrong according to its own standards, but that God thinks differently. That instead of shunning and avoiding, he very purposely approaches and invites. So what's joyous for us about this? Well, you and I are in the same boat. We are not worthy to be loved by God. We're not worthy to be loved by Jesus, His Son. We're not worthy, certainly, to follow Him, and yet He chose us. He called us who would be perfectly at home in that table of tax collectors and sinners. So because of this, therefore, I have joy in Jesus. I want you to say that with me. I have joy in Jesus. Now we get to the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. See, the Jews and the Samaritans, they hated each other. They hated each other so much that the Jews would extend their journeys by miles and miles and days to avoid going through the country of Samaria and interacting with Samaritans. This is why when Jesus speaks to the woman, she expresses shock that He's even talking to her. Like, you would ask me for a drink of water? Because the Jews didn't associate. They didn't have any dealings with Samaritans. Yet again, we have another person who, by worldly standards, is unworthy. Not only with this prejudice between people groups, but also because of the conduct in her own individual life as she carries on her conversation with Jesus, he reveals the truth of her her life, her past relationships, her failed marriages, and the fact that now she lives with a man who is not her husband. But when Jesus knows about all that stuff and reveals it to her, and she is it's revealed to her that He is the Messiah that she was waiting for, what does Jesus offer her? Just judgment and condemnation for her behavior? No, instead, before He even gets to that part, He offers her living water, which was a quite fun conversation with the kids as to what exactly living water is. That's one of those church phrases we hear a bunch So it doesn't sound weird to us, but if you put it in any other context, if you said to somebody on the street later today, hey, I have some living water for you, they're going to think you're a weirdo. So what is this living water that He offers her? It is nothing short of a new, redeemed, and eternal life in Him by virtue of His grace and goodness 
for someone like her. So where is the joy here? We're like her too. Just like she isn't worthy and Matthew isn't worthy, we aren't worthy to be loved by God. We aren't worthy to follow Him, and yet He gives us living water. He gives us a new and eternal life in Him. Right? That was one thing that came up multiple times throughout the week is, you know, the parties that we start, they come to an end, depending on how old you are at 9 or 10 o'clock, maybe at 1 or 2 in the morning, but they all come to an end. But the party that Jesus is starting, the party that He's starting in your life, is an eternal one. It's even better than any party you've ever been to, and it's not coming to an end, which undergirds that joy even more. So, therefore, I have joy in Jesus. Say it with me. I have joy in Jesus. Now we turn to our two parables. What further joys are Jesus, is Jesus going to show us? But we'll start with the parable of the wedding feast from Matthew 22. Jesus, in opposition to the religious leaders, He tells them His parable to teach them something about God. He tells them a parable of a king who's going to throw a great big party, a wedding feast for His Son, and He sends out His messengers to invite those who have been invited. And instead of rejoicing and coming to the party, they reject the invitation. And not only do they reject the invitation, but they harm and kill the messengers who are sent to them. Now, his listeners know, and we know, he's talking about the people of Israel, who he has repeatedly sent prophets and kings to, and they have not listened to the word of the Lord. But the story goes on because after that, the king then sends his messengers out with a new direction. He says, go invite anyone you can find. And so they go out searching everywhere, and anyone they come across, they invite to the party. The bottom line for that day was that everyone is invited to the party because Jesus was teaching them who thought only some of the people were invited, that everyone is invited. And the text specifically says that they found these messengers, they found the good and the bad were invited to the wedding feast. So why is this joyous for us? If it was just the good, we know from Romans, none of us would be invited. But our God invites everyone to the party, even the good and the bad. And Jesus is telling this parable because of sin. He knows Even the religious leaders who think they're the good crowd are not, for all have fallen sin, fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. So we aren't worthy to be invited to God's party, to the the feast of celebration for the work of His Son. We shouldn't get an invitation, yet we do. He sends an invitation even to us. Therefore, I have joy in Jesus. Come on now, say it with me. I have joy in Jesus. Now, the last parable takes this same message that has been spoken about broadly about everyone and drills it down to an individual level when we get to the parable of the prodigal son. Most of you, if not all of you, are very familiar with this parable. An unworthy son who treats his father poorly, he basically treats him as if he's already dead. He wants his inheritance so that he can leave and live his own life free from his father's influence. His father gives him what he asks for, and then he squanders it recklessly until he has nothing left and is living in great need, such great need that even the slop that he's feeding to pigs begins to look appetizing to him. But he comes to his senses and he comes crawling back to his father in desperation and he has a plan. And maybe you've made this plan yourself 
when you've come to your senses in your life and made your way back to God, that, well, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. I've sinned against my Father, I've sinned against heaven, but at least I can be a servant. And so he comes up with this plan to negotiate with his father for at least some servant's place in his household because he says to himself that at least they also get food. But he barely gets his rehearsed speech out because it turns out that it's not really him coming back to his father, but as soon as his father sees him, he runs to him and embraces him as his son. You see, in the story, the amazing thing that Jesus is sharing is there's only one person in the story who thinks that the son is anything other than a son. It's not the father, it's the son himself. He's the one who tells himself that he's no longer worthy because he thinks like a human being like we do. I will confess that I have come to church with a negotiation prepared. Because of my sin, ready to justify myself or make excuses or settle for something other than being a child of God, and like the prodigal son, every time the father runs to me, he runs to you and he wraps you in his arms and he rejoices that his child, his son, has returned. This parable teaches us something not about the Son. We know the Son. We are the Son. We're both, really, both the older and the younger. This parable teaches us something important and joyful about the Father, about our Heavenly Father. God doesn't think the way you and I think. If He did, the negotiations would have started in earnest. And if we were lucky, we would be a servant in His house. But He doesn't do that. He never stops thinking of us as His children, never stops desiring for our return, for what has been lost to be found, for what has died to be brought to new life. And so He sends Jesus. That's what he was trying to teach those listening to this parable, that God has sent me to tell you about His love, a love that loves sinners and calls them to be His disciples, a love that breaks apart any of the prejudices that we set up in our world, that washes clean all the mistakes and sins of our lives, because we are His children. And His desire is for us to enter into the joy of His home. Therefore, I have joy in Jesus. So I'll ask you the same question I asked the kids in the children's message to wrap things up. Did you know that every Sunday is a small experience, a foretaste of the party that God has in store for us in eternity? When's the last time you thought of Sunday morning as a party? Well, I hope you'll think of it more now. Because right now today, all the elements of a great party are present. You have the best food in the entire world. Fellowship with fellow broken and redeemed and loved unworthy sinners who are children of God and a deep and abiding joy in the many and innumerable gifts, to use the words of Paul in our epistle reading, that have been lavished on us. Every Sunday, the pouring out of Christ's blood for the forgiveness of our sins wipes away the past that we think makes us no longer worthy, and instead, when God looks at us, He sees His perfect, righteous, and holy Son. So maybe today you're like the prodigal son and you came to negotiate with God to justify yourself in His sight. You can let that go. That's why we take that deep breath before we start our service. 
And I remind you that you're not here to do something. You're not here to make yourself worthy. That's a lost cause. But not with Jesus. He has made you worthy. He is here to bring His gifts. Know that as soon as God sees you, He sees His beloved child. Nothing else. Which is why at the end of your confession, every time your sins are forgiven because of Jesus. Maybe like Matthew and the Samaritan woman, you think you're not worthy of the attention and love of God because of the past mistakes of your life. Like them, the world may even write you off and despise you, just as they did those. Jesus does not. He loves you. When others avoid you, He walks right up to you, and He calls you to be His own disciple and give you a new and eternal life. This is what Peter is talking about at the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. Having received the Holy Spirit, the concurrent theme in his sermon is one of joy. Joy at what is being revealed in Jesus. So I'm going to close with reading a few of those verses again. Starting in verse 24, Peter says, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. That is what's happening to you today. And it will continue every Sunday when He invites you to the party in His home to give you His gifts until He returns in glory and we begin that party in earnest without end in His kingdom. Therefore, say it with me, I have joy in Jesus. Amen.